to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. A pioneer, one of India's most respected business leaders, and one of the men synonymous with the success of India's IT industry. The story of N.R. Narayan Murthy and how he and the young team he brought together created Infosys is the stuff of corporate legend in India. But what is as significant is how leaders like him and other industry pioneers managed to imbibe their own strong values in the companies and build a world-class industry. What was that journey like? Hello again, and here we are with Mr. Narayan Murthy. Mr. Narayan Murthy, of course, knows everybody and everybody knows him in the IT industry. But for some of you who have heard of his reputation with Infosys and so many other great things he's done, let me start with a very personal anecdote. I remember first time meeting Mr. Murthy. I think it was at a NASCOM offsite in the 90s in Jodhpur. And I was immediately struck by the man's wisdom, of course, which all of us know but also his simplicity, his candor, and the way he can come to the essence of it. So I'm really looking forward to this interview. And Mr. Murthy, if I could start by just asking you to say a few words about yourself. Who is Narayan Murthy and what are your beginnings and where are you today? Well, you know, I'm, I come from a very ordinary family. I'm an ordinary man. My father was for most of his career, a high school teacher. We were eight children, my grandmother. So we came from a lower middle class family. We were moving around mostly in uh, Mofusil, Karnataka. Uh, I did my bachelor degree in engineering, electrical engineering from University of Mysore and did my graduate studies from IIT Kanpur. Uh, I worked at IIM Ahmedabad as a chief systems programmer and then went off to Paris to work on a very aspirational project. And I learned a lot of good things, uh, not so much in computer science because I was reasonably okay in computer science, outside computer science about capitalism, about compassionate capitalism. I hitchhiked my way all the way from Paris to Mysore. I took about 11 and a half months on the road. I spent all of $450. And then I decided that I should come back. You know, when I come go back to India, I should conduct an experiment in uh, entrepreneurship. My first attempt, Sophronics, which I, you know, did in Pune was a failure because there was no market, there was no domestic market. I quickly learned it, I closed it down in nine months and then I joined as the general manager at PCS and uh, I learned a lot about export market and then I started Infosys and God has been very, very kind to us uh, because it made a set of seven ordinary people do what was uh, aspirational for all of us. So I would say I'm a product of luck by and large. Luck is very important. I have always believed because I know so many friends of mine, my classmates who are much smarter than I was, much smarter, but somehow, they didn't get to the level that we did. So I have thought a lot about it and I have finally come to the conclusion that it was luck. But of course, Louis Pasteur said, God favors the prepared mind. So in some sense, we all, there was some contribution from our side too. We had prepared for it well. And therefore, God's grace was on us and he favored the prepared. That's what I was. And I was the 
vice president of NASCOM between 1990 and uh, 1992. And then I was the president of NASCOM between 92 and 94. Harish Mehta was my boss. He was the president between 90 and 92 when I was the vice president. We had some extraordinary people during that time in uh, KV Ramani, in Ashang Desai, in Vijay Srirangan, Dr. Arvind Shah, uh, then Shaurabh Srivastava, and many of these people, people who contributed so significantly to building of NASCOM. Of course, the central focus was Devang Mehta. He did a wonderful job. So we'll talk about it later as part of our discussion. Thank you. Urti, just to ask you this question, because I mean, we all know that I started my career in manufacturing and uh, we were all in fairly nondescript com companies in a very weak manufacturing industry. And suddenly, almost out of the blue, this yeah. IT sector or the IT services industry came in. So if you think about it, you know, with, with, the, with, with the benefit of hindsight and your participation in it, what is it that made us have the confidence to create a truly global industry in a country where the word global was just being talked about? Uh, there were several factors why the IT services different uh, services industry was different, has become different. First, it was the market that we chose. The U.S. corporations have traditionally understood the power of technology in gaining competitive advantage in the market. There is no other country in the world which has understood the power of technology in gaining competitive advantage in the marketplace. The IT services providers chose the US rather than India or Europe or Japan as their first market. That was a very important reason. Second, there was an explosion in the market opportunity in the US in the early and middle 80s due to several reasons, probably three of them. The first one, Ganesh, was the availability of inexpensive super mini computers like DEC Wax 1150, Wax 1180, Data Journal MV4000 and Data Journal MV8000. IBM AS400, Prime, et cetera, et cetera. These were inexpensive and they were super mini computers. So therefore, there was a desire for corporations to use this. Second, these platforms, these hardware platforms introduced OLTP or online transaction processing uh, platforms based on relational databases. You know, Ganesh, very well that unless there is an OLTP platform, you cannot build commercial systems. Third, these two major uh, technology changes help many medium-sized companies as well as departments of several large companies in the US to take to commercial transaction oriented computing in a big way. Therefore, opportunities for developing transaction oriented commercial applications on these inexpensive super mini computers exploded in the 80s. There was a fourth and very important reason, and that was there were lots of unemployed engineers in the country, including a reasonable number from IITs, who had no jobs. And the Indian software services companies used their services to exploit the market. So the reasons can be summed up, as, summed up as choosing the US market, which is very dynamic in using new technology. 
Second, availability of new technology like inexpensive commercial transaction oriented computing. And third, availability of talent in India. Now, you will notice, Ganesh, that all successful Indian software service companies focused on the export market rather than depending on the domestic market, which hardly existed at that time. Now, let me come to the, the next reason. As my good friend, Sri Rahul Bajaj has often said, Competition is the best management guru and it teaches you to do everything necessary to attract and retain customers, attract and retain employees, and attract and retain investors. When Indian companies started competing the US market, which is the most competitive market in the world, they quickly realized that they had to bring distinctive competitive differentiation vis-a-vis -vis their US, European, and Indian competitors. That's why Indian companies started getting certified for ISO 9001, CMM level four and level five. And some companies like Infosys even went for the Malcolm Baldrige certification. Some of them got listed on NASDAQ and NYSC. The fourth reason is it was around this time that the economic reforms of 1991 happened. That allowed the US high tech companies to come back to India with 100% equity, which George Fernandez had banned in 1977, as you know. This started heavy competition, not for the customers. Since most of the high-tech multinationals that came to India in 1991 were selling hardware and software products. They were not into software services. But the competition that we had to face was for talent. That is when the Indian companies realized that they had to become employee focused and they had to address a very important issue that is how do we attract, enable, empower and retain the best and the brightest. That's how they started creating a good career growth path, a modern workplace, up-to-date technology, and other employee facilities like FTV and relaxation places and competitive compensations. Of course, companies like Infosys introduced employee stock option plans because they couldn't compete with the cost center strategy of MNCs in India. Therefore, it is fair to say that export orientation, focus on the US market, accepting competition both internally and in India, and using innovation to compete successfully in the marketplace, and to attract and retain talent were the main reasons why this industry has succeeded so well. If our software services companies had focused on the domestic market, Ganesh, I can guarantee you that they would have remained pygmies and withered away. Even today, Ganesh, if you look at the top five IT services companies, not more than five or 10% of the revenue comes from the domestic market. And most of it is not profitable. Let me stop here. No, that's very, very, I mean, it's very comprehensive, uh, Smurti, what you said. But let me ask you a question. Yeah. I mean, obviously, people like you, Mr. Kohli, Mr. Premji, Mr. Nader, the early pioneers, if you will, of this industry, had it in you in terms of the confidence to take this story to America and start getting those initial customers. And then came the gentleman you mentioned, Devang Mehta. And I want to ask you, what do you think is the role that NASCOM played? You were already in business, Infosys, TCS were already successful. What do you think was the role of NASCOM in mobilizing a larger mass of companies and taking it to the global market? Well, uh, Ganesh, I presume you are asking about the role of NASCOM during the early 90s 
and the role of uh, Devang Mehta during the 90s. As you know very well, NASCOM was founded in 1988. It was really in Ramani's room in a hotel in Washington, D.C. Ramani, Hari, Shashank, Shara, uh, many of them were there. And they realized that there was a need to create a strong and authentic voice for the software services industry in dealing with the government. A set of factors came together in the early 90s. First was that there were two extraordinary bureaucrats at that time. First was Sri N. Vittal, and second was Dr. N. Sheshigari. Vittal was perhaps the finest bureaucrat that this country has ever produced. Dr. Sheshigari was a visionary. Sri Vittal was wedded to the decentralization of powers, innovations like STPs and earth stations, and unheard of speed of decision in, in Delhi. He would give, uh, as you remember, uh, Ganesh, keynote address in every NASCOM in the early days at our annual meeting. He would exhort us to achieve the aspirational targets by telling stories from Mahabharata, the Ramayana and Birbal, etc., etc. I still remember in 1991, he had just told the story of the flying horse, that Birbal story of the flying horse. Then he threw a challenge to us that he would fight for tax exemption for the industry if we promised him to take the industry revenue from just US dollars 100 million 1991 to about 400 million dollars in 1996. Five years, just 400 million dollars. But Ganesh, you remember, everybody was silent. I was sitting next to my wonderful friend, Dr. Prakash Hebalkar. In my opinion, Prakash Hebalkar is one of the smartest thinkers of our generation in India. He reminded me about the flying horse story that we had just heard. And he said, what have you learned from that flying horse story? Why don't you go to the podium and come into the target? saying, who knows, the horse may fly up rock. Look, as I told you, I'm a great admirer of Prakash. I would listen to him very carefully. And as, as I told you, at that time, I was the vice president of NASCOM. But my boss, Harish Mehta, the president, for some reason, he did not seem to be keen to commit. I mean, he's a wise man. You know, definitely much more mature than I am, much wiser than I am. And therefore, probably he kept quiet. But I just went and committed. The rest is history, Ganesh. The point I'm making is that the objectives of NASCOM at that time were very clear in those days. The objectives were three. One was to remove friction to business from the government which the economic reforms and Sri Vittal were doing on our behalf. And the second was to obtain tax exemption. And the third was to enhance visibility for the Indian software industry abroad. I must say that Devon as the anchor person brought tremendous value in making these three happen. He was very popular, as you know, at the electronics bhavan. He was a very charming personality with his toupee and all of that. Now, let me talk about popularizing India's strength in our market and potential market, which is the US, Europe, Australia, and Japan. This is an area where Devong excelled. He was a showman. He held excellent presentations 
in various capital cities. I mean, I have been with him to Washington DC, to West Berlin, you know, so many, London, Tokyo, many places. And in India, if you remember Ganesh, he would bring models, Bollywood stars and singers to our functions to create excitement for our attendees. He worked very hard. He was a 20 hour day work horse. Those days, we were also very popular in Asia, thanks to Asocio, which is the Asian and Oceanic uh, Computing Industry Organization. Thanks to the hard work of my wonderful friend, Ashan Desar. As I told you, we had brilliant and committed people like Sri Kevi Ramani, Sri Vijay Sri Rangan, and Dr. Arvind Shah. They made Devon look even better with their research and deep analysis of important issues. Of course, Harish is a natural leader and he made Devon look even more lustrous. I would say that Devon's signal contribution to NASCOM was making NASCOM popular with the governments, not just in India, but also with governments in the US and in Europe. Let me stop here. Oh, absolutely, Mr. Murthy, you're so right. And my own experiences with Devang Mehta is, I mean, exactly that. I remember, I think four of us, including you and me, were yeah. on a, I think, four day trip to Germany. Yeah. We yeah. talked about Devang stories, etc. Yeah. And it was amazing to see that even the yeah. stories that Devang Mehta told, if yeah. we repeated it, would get the same response from the audience. Yeah. Imagine yeah. the originality of that matter. Yeah. He, remember. he, he yeah. was a showman. There is absolutely no doubt. And I think we all learned. He brought a lot of wounds to the platform. Yeah, you know those those wonderful fashion walks and everything else. I, I don't know if you remember things uh, because of Devan. I don't know if you remember Ganesh. In one of those NASCOM functions, he had brought Bipasha Basu and eleven other models. And he stood in the center with some shawl and all of that, and all these models were on either side of his. I mean, his thing was to bring excitement to NASCO. He wanted us to have a good time because his philosophy was, you enjoy life, but at the same time work hard. And he wanted every one of us to contribute maximum to NASCAR. So he said, I will make your time. I will make uh, it worth your while. And that was something extraordinary. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. In this context, Murthy, Mr. Murthy, let's talk a little bit about Infosys. Because I know you've said it was you know, God's gift. It was luck. Yeah. None of those, I believe. Because I know there was Narayan Murthy. There were... A, a vision, values, passion that you created. And for so many people, I mean, there are many young people trying to build companies today. And But the creation of an institution of such stature, I still remember you are saying so many times, under promise, over delivered, and you over delivered all the time. So in a sense, it was the iconic industry symbol that many of us built our companies around trying to emulate. So tell us a little more about the philosophy of Infosys, I mean, what made it the icon it is today, even today? Thank you very much for those kind words, Ganesh. You've always been very, very kind to us at Infosys and to me. I'm very grateful. Right from the first day and till we, the founders, retired from the company in 2014, the founders of NASCOM operated on a set of principles that ensured the longevity of emphasis. Let me talk about a few of them. First, we were perhaps one of the first in the world to demonstrate on a large scale, and definitely in India, that entrepreneurial opportunity 
is not the preserve of a chosen few, like it used to happen in India before liberalization and before the availability of venture capital. That was our first principle, our first objective. Second, emphasis has demonstrated to the next generation of entrepreneurs that it is possible to succeed in business in contemporary India, legally and ethically. The third thing that we did was that we have demonstrated that the only way an Indian company can become world-class is by benchmarking itself with the best global companies in every dimension of operation. We did it in HR, we did it in finance, we did it in quality, we did it in software development, we did it in infrastructure, you name it. In every uh, fee, in every function, we said, what is the world's best? Can we create a path for us to move from where we are today to, to become the world's best. And in some, we did reasonably well. The next thing that we did was we conducted the country's first experiment in large-scale democratization of wealth. As of today, Infosys has distributed more than, slightly more than 20% of its equity to employees worth more than 115,000 crores. This is outside the founder wealth. Every one of the founders has become a billionaire and some have become many times. No other company has done this either in India or abroad. We have created $4,000 millionaires and about probably 30,000 to 40,000 rupee millionaires. Fifth, emphasis has followed and reaped huge benefit from leadership by example. In my opinion, there is no more powerful instrument for leaders to gain the trust of their younger colleagues than by walking the talk and practicing the precept like Mahatma Gandhi did. Ganesh, you probably remember what Sarojini Naidu said about Gandhi. Gandhi used to insist on wearing a loincloth, traveling by third class, meeting large number of people. And they realized, Gandhi's followers, that is very dangerous. Who knows, some, some Britisher may put a bullet into Gandhi. So therefore, they had to have a lot of, uh, you know, plain clothes people around Gandhi when he was traveling on train. And so Sarojini Naidu once said, it takes a fortune to keep this old man in poverty. It was well worth it, Ganesh, as you know. It was well worth spending a fortune to have that man live in poverty because he was an icon of the poorest Indian. And his every word meant lot of value to every one of the probably 500 million Indians that were there at that point of time. Now, let me go to the next one. As Jeff Bezos once said, entrepreneurs must be missionaries and not mercenaries. You know, Jeff, Jeff Bezos you know, is a very bright person, extremely bright person. They have, he said, these entrepreneurs have to have a larger than life, grand and noble vision. We at Infosys, in our own small way, have tried to be missionaries and not mercenaries. The, next, the interests of the company 
has always come ahead of the interest of the individuals at the emphasis. Ganesh, you know very well that managing with six founders is not an easy thing. I haven't seen any other success. In fact, once even Bill Gates said that I am really surprised. I'm very appreciative that you six people have lived together and demonstrated that you can still manage. You know why? Whatever is we may be our strengths and weaknesses and all each one of us has strengths and weaknesses, but one thing was very clear. Everybody put the interests of the company ahead of his or her, his, in, his personal interest in every decision. And I have no hesitation in saying, Ganesh, that if in the next Janma of mine, I have to choose, I have to become an entrepreneur, and I have to choose colleagues, I would choose the same co-founders that I did in 1981. Now, let me get to the eighth one. My friend, Sri Rahul Bajaj told me once, Competition is the best management tool. We have practiced his precept and use innovation in every field to attract and retain customers, employees, and investors. And we have embraced competition passionately, and I've already talked about it, so I won't expand. Next, we use data and facts and not personal biases and opinion to take decisions in every transaction in the company. That's how six of us, of course, we are seven. Ashok Parora left us in 1989. So you can say fair, you can it's fair to say it's six of us. Six for six of us to continue to be together and smiling. This is a very important factor. Sometimes we did use intuition and our gut feeling on top of what the data told us. Next, we believed that transparency, accountability, and fairness enhance the trust of every stakeholder in the governance of a company. And we acted according to this important belief. Next, we realized and acted according to our belief that investors understand that every business will have ups and downs and that they want us to level with them at all points of time. That's why we operated using adages, when in doubt, it disclose, under promise and over deliver and let the good news take the stairs, but ensure that the bad news always takes the elevator. Next, today's entrepreneurs are the evangelists of capitalism in India. Ganesh, you alluded to that earlier. Capitalism is new in India and is not trusted by most people. Therefore, right from the beginning, we embraced compassionate capitalism and conducted ourselves as exemplars of that philosophy. That required us to practice values respected by our society, to lead unostentatious lives, to have a fair share of compensation between the highest and the lowest levels of employees in our companies. This is, I'm saying, up to 2014, okay? To ensure that the salary increases are first given to lower level employees before considering the senior management staff, to operate as trustees on behalf of our shareholders in, in running our companies, and to provide full transparency to the shareholders and to follow the best sustainability principles. And finally, not to create externalities like pollution of air and water 
and of course to end the goodwill of the society in every country that we operate in let me stop here that is such an amazing uh, basket of goodies if i may call it that because it literally touches all the points that we talk about even in today for modern organizations and you talked about three adages uh, murti so i mean I, i'll add one more which we are all very fond of i think which comes from you in god we trust yeah. the rest of you big data so i think which is which kind of takes me to the next question yeah. you are seen as the czar if i may use the word of corporate governance in this country i think sebi recognizes it many industries hold you up in very high esteem so yeah. tell us a few thoughts on corporate governance i mean at a time when everybody is suspecting everybody else of doing something or the other how do you build a company how do you build a personal life which is the highest principles of governance you know there are three very important attributes for us to have peace of mind i mean i thought a lot about it i try and practice i don't succeed all the time but i try and remind myself every day whenever possible first is we must exercise self control on greed on jealousy and on anger now this is easier said than done i can't claim that i have succeeded far from that but if we you and i the leaders of capitalism in this country if we were to keep this in mind and remember every night before we go to sleep tomorrow morning i will be less greedy than what i am i will get angry fewer times than what i did today and i will show less jealousy than what i did today i think we will have inner peace there is nothing in life more important than inner peace that is where i am a great admirer of the indian philosophy hindu philosophy pardon me for saying hindu philosophy but that's a fact i mean i who am i to question that and if we the leaders keep this in mind when we are sitting in the board and if we ask a very simple question before we take any important decision then i believe everything will be all right what is that question and that question ganesh you have asked that question i have no doubt about it i think all our nascom colleagues have asked that question and that is will this decision of ours or mine enhance respect for the company in the eyes of its stakeholders and respect for me in the eyes of all my peers all my colleagues all my juniors all my seniors in the eyes of the government in the eyes of the bureaucracy in the eyes of the civil society leaders and if this piece of news of this decision of mine were to appear on the front page of economic times tomorrow morning will it make me happy or unhappy that's all what you need to do. there is nothing more that we need to do to enhance good governance i think this is easier said than done as i told you we all try we fail but that 
trying itself is the first good step towards achieving inner peace of mind and to make our corporations better and to make this country a better you know as the chinese say a thousand mile journey starts with the first step and that first step is very deep you know better than i do that first step is very very tough but the moment you took that first step the second step becomes simpler the third step is easy and then you will be run most of us fail in taking that first step and that first step is to say i will control my greed i will control my jealousy i always say no no that fellow has got this much wealth it has come in fortune therefore i have to get more that jealousy burns only me it doesn't burn you see the, the sad thing about jealousy is it doesn't burn the other party it only burns me then we will become better human beings we will never reach perfection because only god is perfect rest of us are human beings but we can still try to move towards that perfection asymptotically we may never reach there but we will make slow progress so murthy a quick corollary to that yeah i mean i was just thinking while you were talking about you know my own life i grew up in a little village in jharkhand yeah, and when yeah. i became ceo of aptech at the age of 33 yeah, yeah i know i know i know you almost very yeah and i was wondering why atul nishra trusted me to become a ceo at the age of 33 so every step you took was from that humility of being from a very middle class background and saying whatever we do we should do good for society we should not do any false moves etc so is it because of the essentially middle class nature of this industry that we have so many icons of good corporate governance you know i i am quite used to telling some stories i hope you don't mind see i was once talking to shri vichar in early 90s so he as you know vichar came from gujarat cadre i think he was probably industry secretary there or whatever it is so i asked vichar sir what is it that you find somewhat unusual about our industry this was uh, after he had, he had left uh, that uh, department doe secretary shape you know he was the cvc head or something like that it was coming yeah quite a few years after so he said would you let me tell you some from my own experience he said in other industries the entrepreneur came whatever gujarat uh, state financial corporation whatever it is i in a you know in a in a completely beaten up uh, ambassador car when he wanted the loan but after several years he a few years he came in a mercedes benz to renegotiate the loan he said however in your industry you people continue to come in this ambassador written up ambassador he said i find it very strange so i think you are right those are middle class values middle class every civilization has been advanced primarily by the middle class people whether it's in england whether it's in germany india japan us don't matter it is the middle class that has contributed primarily to intellectual leadership to value leadership etc so you are right in some sense our parents went on uh you know advising us filibustering on the well on good values on honesty on decency on courtesy on leading a simple life etc etc our teachers did that 
So therefore, I think as middle class students, we were drilled into this. And by and large, our culture was shaped by our parents, grandparents, our uh, early uh, and childhood friends, our teachers, et cetera, et cetera. And I think you are in some sense, that's right. That's very interesting, Mr. Mullah. So let me move to the last conversation I want to have with Mr. Narayan Murthy, not necessarily yeah. the founder of Infosys, yeah. great man from ASCOM. And just as a background, I mean, I've thoroughly enjoyed the last one year. It sounds like an oxymoron because I managed to write a complete book with my wife on digital success and mm -hmm. also got tapped by Dr. Raghunath Mashilkar and Pune International Center yeah. to be the convener of the policy research group for India-China Symmetry, which yeah. of course, yeah. Yeah. I've done more reading in the last 12 months than I've done in the rest of my life. And collaborating with people of the caliber of Dr. Vijay Kelkar, Dr. Yeah. Ajay Shah, Ajit Ranade, Gautam Bambavali, etc. It's been a great learning for me. And in fact, we've just finished that 60,000 word paper and a 10,000 word summary is on its way. I think it's probably reached you as well, along with other 40 other you know, yeah. opinion leaders in this country. The reason I'm giving you this preamble is, it kind of it's made me think about India. You know, the concept of India, the idea of India, the future of India. So yeah. that's why I said, can, can Mr. Narayan Murthy tell us, especially the many, many people in this country who are looking forward to an India with optimism, with some sense of fear sometimes, what is the future of India? What do you think we should be doing to make sure that the future that is in the dreams of so many young people in this country is realized? Well, I think this is a, again a wonderful question, uh, Ganesh. Only a deep thinking person like you would, you know, would ask such question and justifiably so. You know, my view is reducing our population growth rate and improving the quality of the children born in the next. 50 to 100 years has to be the most important priority for India in the coming decades. As you know, Ganesh, the quality of children is going down year after year. Middle class couples with the ability to provide nutritious food, and take care of the health of their children, education of their children, et cetera, et cetera, have limited the number of children to two. Also, if I'm not wrong, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I may be correct too. In the Bimaru states, the population is increasing more than in the better off states. That's my understanding, but I may be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Now, what is it that is required to ensure that we focus on population, controlling the population growth? This requires laser focus on family planning, aggressive promotion of condoms, educating couple about the negatives of having more than two children, and improving the quality of nutrition for children and mothers. Now, improving the nutrition of school-going children is another extremely important initiative. And I'm very, very proud of Akshay Bhatra. You know, my friend uh, Mondas Pai and Swamiji started that. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, they serve 1.8 million children hot food every day, hot nutritious food. So improving the nutrition of school going children is very important. Improving the quality of education and healthcare are also Healthcare of our children are also very, very critical to improve the country in the next 30 to 50 years. If our children are better prepared today, when they are 
30, 40, they will be in a position to contribute better. Of course, for us to do all of this, we have to improve our governance. You know very well. That requires us to improve the income levels of our citizens by creating jobs with good income. You see, once we improve the income level of our citizens, hopefully corruption will go down. Better, better quality people will come into our politics and there'll be a lot of confidence, a lot of hope in the country that, yeah, we have done all these wonderful things, therefore we can do even better things, et cetera. As you know, about 42% of Indians depend on agriculture, which just produces about 16% of our GDP. That means the per capita GDP of a person in the agricultural area is just 40% of India's low per capita GDP of rupees 1.3 lakhs per year or US dollars 1853 or something like that. That means an agricultural worker can earn only about 4,500 rupees per month. This is the average. The reality, you know, I mean, uh, it may, in fact, it may be even much lower than this. So therefore, we have to move people from agriculture to low-tech manufacturing industry because they are not well-educated, it cannot be absorbed in IT services industry, et cetera, et cetera. Now, let me now come to the most difficult task we have to do this, to improve our economic. For us to do enough to improve our economic future. I am a Weberian. In other words, I believe in Max Weber. And therefore, I believe that a cultural change in India is extremely important. We have to focus on honesty, on hard work, lack of apathy, on discipline, on speed of action, on accountability, on transparency, you name it. In other words, we have to behave like a Western developed country in terms of our public governance. Now, we Indians have a lot of wonderful values in our family life. All of that is no doubt about it. However, we have to adopt and bring a good combination of public governance from the Western model and the family handling from the wonderful, successful Indian model. Now, at this point in time, I am going to lapse back, lapse back to problems. I want everybody to understand this. Ganesh, India has had four unique problems that no other country in the world has had. Let me list them. First, we are the only country in the world, I would like to be corrected, I may be wrong, that was defeated by every invader from Ghazni, Kilji, Barber, British, French, Dutch, and the Portuguese. For thousand years, from somewhere between 940 AD or 950 AD and 1947, everybody that came defeated us. Second, and that Ghazni fellow, if I'm not wrong, came 17 times. India is the only country in the world, at least the Bibaru part of it, that was ruled by foreigners for about 1,000 years. 
That is, right? We were not in control of our destiny. Some foreigner, somebody from Afghanistan or some Central Asia or England or France or Netherlands, they ruled us. So we're not in control of our destiny. So the second, this is the second unique thing. And it's for a long, long period, a combination of all these guys had control over us for thousand years. Third, India is the only major country in the world that has been afflicted by the caste system, which has proved to be a lethal instrument against our progress. Unfortunately, the so-called forward caste inflicted such unbelievable suffering on the lower caste. India remained a poor country for a long time. I think the, 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 the leaders of the forward caste have to take that responsibility. Anyway, so we have to fight caste and class. So therefore, what does it mean? Other countries have the problem of only class, whereas India has to fight two battles. It has to fight the caste battle and it has to fight the class battle. Fourth, among the countries with large population, India has the highest population density. Let me give you data. The result is, before I give you data, let me say it. The result is land is at the highest premium in India. So industrialization is very, very difficult in India. We all know what happened to Tata when they went to Bengal, right? They had to close down there. Now, let me give you data on this, on our uh, uh, density. China has 1.1 times our population but they have three times our land mass, right? Therefore, our density of population is 2.5 times that of China. The US has three times our land mass, but US is only one fourth or less than one fourth of our population. Therefore, our population density is somewhere between 12 and 13 times that of the US. In other words, the land that one American has is available to 12 to 13 Indians. Brazil has three times our land mass and just one seventh of our population. That means our density is 20 times larger than Brazil. Now, However, unfortunately, this issue, this major issue has not been given up, has, has rather been given up since 1976, when Sanjay Gandhi used forced sterilization. That was a mistake. And unfortunately, you know, I used to be part of, uh, Ratan and I were part of uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's uh, Population Council. But we didn't find anything worthwhile happening there. We attended so many meetings, nothing. So for somewhere around 45 years now, Ganesh, we have given up on population control. I want to see very important and very imminent action on population control. So I think if we did some of these things that I talked about, we have things. Then there is something else that I want to talk about. We are also perhaps the most static civilization in the world. We have remained corrupt apathetic, not hardworking, you know, egoistic and full of ourselves, even though the reality is different. We see so many nations performing better than us, but we don't want to learn from them. We don't want to follow them. 
Therefore, we have to become dynamic and we have to change. We have to overcome our apathy. We have to become disciplined. We have to treat public property as we treat our private property. We have to become, as I said, more open-minded to learn from other nations in honesty, hardworking, discipline, proaction in problem solving. We have to demonstrate national pride by our actions rather than by singing national anthem and flying our flags. Those things don't help. What will help is our action. Now, I think these are some of the things that we need to do. We have to revamp our bureaucracy to improve accountability and efficiency. And we have to enhance the productivity of our bureaucracy. If we want progress, we have to improve the quality of our politicians. I mean, there are, there is a certain percentage of our politicians who are very good, absolutely no doubt. But by and large, there is a major change of part. We have to understand from other countries. We have to understand from China what they did to enhance their exporters, exports to become the largest exporter in the world from the same level as Indians in the early 80s or late 70s. This is a very important task. As you know, our economy does not have the purchasing capacity if we started producing for the domestic market. We don't have. Therefore, we have to create a large number of jobs. And that can only happen by focusing on export. I, my own view is that we have to improve our exports from the current probably somewhere around 16% of our GDP to about 40% of our GDP. Well, I took a long time because this is my favorite topic. You asked me and I couldn't stop. So therefore, sorry, I took a long time. No, no, that was absolutely fascinating, Mr. Murthy, because I think what, we, what you've really done is described the past, the present, and a possible great future for the country. Yeah. So it's absolutely amazing to have this conversation. So let me stop by saying thank you very much. You've been very generous with your time. And of course, the free flow of your wisdom. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Mr. Murthy, and really, really look forward to future conversations. Thank you. Oh, it is. As I said right in the beginning, you are a unique person. You are always positive, you're full of energy. You always see the glass half full. And these are extremely important qualities to bring confidence to our children, to bring, to enhance the confidence coefficient in the air. And that I think people like you are doing it. So we are all, we remain very, very grateful to you. And all that I can see is more powerful.